President of Colombia Juan Manuel Santos is the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. This is a prize that has been awarded since 1910 to 85 men and 15 women. Some years have not had any winners awarded at all, and in some years institutions have won. In 1910, for example, the Permanent International Peace Bureau of Switzerland won, and in both 1917 and 1944, the International Red Cross won. <coughs> In 2009, Barack Obama won the Peace Prize, not because of any specific action that he had taken or any specific event, but rather to offer hope in that his presidency would bring a new era of hope and change to U.S. race relations. And this year, very similarly, the prize has been awarded in encouragement and in the spirit of optimism around Colombia's peace process. It's been a very difficult struggle. Uh, for President Santos to bring peace to the table. It has not gone particularly well as of late. However, uh, this is an award that's been given to encourage the Colombian people to make the significant compromises and changes that would be required for a lasting peace. Most people in Canada have probably not traveled to Colombia, um, which is a real shame. It's probably one of the most beautiful and ecologically and culturally diverse places in all of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and in addition, uh, people probably don't know a lot about Colombia. It's mainly known for some of its primary exports, such as wonderful, rich, dark coffee, tropical flowers, and of course, Shakira. Uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it's also, however, known, one of it, the few things it's known for is violence, and it's been home to one of the longest civil wars in the Western world. Uh, officially is the longest civil war in the Americas, lasting for 52 years this year. And as Jen has already mentioned, uh, over 200,000 dead and up to around 7 million people have been displaced or dispossessed. Uh, the groups that are responsible for this long war are many, um, but in particular I'm going to speak about the FARC, which is the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. The FARC has long civil war and Cold War origins. Uh, they emerged originally as the armed wing of the Colombian Communist Party. Um, if you can think back to the 1940s and 50s and put yourself back in that moment in time, uh, they were responding to pressures of the Colombian state uh, to respond to the concerns of an increasingly marginalized peasantry that weren't finding their issues being resolved in public forums. The Communist Party thought that militant struggle would be one way to bring those issues to the fore. The FARC have had a number of different public faces uh, since they were first originated which included links to kidnapping, drug trafficking, and extortion, but it also has provided social services in very remote areas, such as economic supports, social security benefits, emergency medical care, and other valuable things to communities that otherwise were seen as not important to the Colombian state. It stood as a very strong force of resistance to US intervention, in particular in the longstanding War on Drugs campaign which had severe consequences, both for small farmers and for civilians in Colombia, but also had broader uh, economic implications for the country, making it more difficult for Colombia to compete for foreign investment dollars, for grants from World Bank and the IMF, uh, and for tourist dollars to an otherwise beautiful place to visit. By the 1980s, the FARC's ongoing conflict against the state led to a rise in proliferation of private security forces. Uh, they're often referred to as paramilitary forces. Groups that were funded by predominantly large private landowners, sometimes with the sanction of the state, sometimes without. And these paramilitary groups uh, were used in many cases to help expropriate peasants in very strategic resource areas, to which Canadian companies have sometimes benefited. Uh, this long and outstanding struggle uh, illustrates that it's a very complex, uh, with a for broad number of different dimensions, struggle, long and ongoing. And so, why does Santos belong in this group of other Nobel Peace Prize winners? I have four reasons that I wish to offer today. Predominantly, that it was a very courageous act uh, to begin to confront these issues, first and foremost, because striking a deal of any kind with the FARC uh, was a tremendous risk. The FARC enjoys probably a less than 5% approval rating in the public at large, and most Colombians and others see them as criminals. 
uh, people who have constantly broken ceasefires and have continued to use extortive methods to get what they needed. And so any kind of compromise solution with this group is seen by a broad public and by outsiders as unjust and unfair, as rewarding criminal activity. Secondly, Colombia has had a very difficult position vis-a-vis -vis the US, one of the most important regional powers in the region. And uh, in order to prevent having to take the US's recommendation to have a strong military solution to the conflict, Santos has had to stand up and argue that for his people, this would involve too many civilian casualties, which became a very unpopular position to defend. The third part of why this is such a big risk for him is, and probably this is a very opportune moment to bring this up, peace by referendum puts a tremendous amount of faith in democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us coming from faculty council meetings as well, <laughs> but broader, democracy is not something that everyone is feeling entirely uh, unskeptical about at the moment, and in fact, uh, President Santos did not get the peace process through the first referendum, but he hasn't stopped. And fourth, and this is probably something that as an historian interests me the most, peace here in this region means reintegrating former militants back into civil society, not leaving them out in the cold, uh, giving them options for having careers that they could get back involved in, being active participants in civil society and public life in different ways. And more critically, it means bringing the FARC into the historical record, giving them a place and recognizing what part of their struggle was legitimate and which parts were perhaps in excess showing and acknowledging that this civil war had more than one side for a broader public. Santos was elected in 2012. He was not given a popular mandate to bring the peace process back into the table, but he did so, and the FARC continued throughout this process to remain militant in many cases, and so this was a very difficult moment to continue forward. He's made very slow but deliberate progress, and the FARC, uh, which has very deep roots and in many ways acts as a pseudo-government, has in fact also made significant uh, strides in working towards peace. Uh, Santos has needed to address the reasons why the FARC has enjoyed its popularity in these places, and he has also needed to hopefully uh, continue to align the priorities not only of his government, but also of all of the other institutions of the state that also have their own relationships with various actors in the field. This is very tricky work, uh, but if he's successful, he will have ended the longest and bloodiest Cold War struggle in all of the Western Hemisphere. And for that, he deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> but he also needs to uh, be awarded this prize together alongside his people, for whom, for whom we see this as a gesture of hope, but also one requiring responsibility. And I personally wish them all much success.